is just the beginning. Hi, everyone. I'm Ina Fried, Chief Technology Correspondent for Axios. I'd like to welcome everyone joining us, whether you're coming from the Axios website, our app, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, however you found us, we're glad you're here. This is the next in our continuing conversation around transportation and COVID-19. I'd like to thank Lyft for sponsoring this. Um, and as part of this series, we're going to have another set of conversations, all really aimed to get us smarter, faster around the subject of the future of transportation and how that's been complicated with the pandemic. Uh, so we'll be going for about 30 minutes with four different conversations, again, hoping to form one broader dialogue on the topic. We have policymakers, innovators, other experts in the area. Um, first off, I'd like to welcome the former Secretary of Transportation and co-chair of Building America's Future, Ray LaHood. Uh, Secretary LaHood, thanks so much for joining us. Good day. Good to be with you. Excellent. Well, I know you've obviously been focused on transportation for a long time. Um, we've all been sort of thinking about how transportation is shifting, whether it's uh, the addition of autonomous cars that's, you know, a long-term transition, but that's going to radically reshape things, as well as the things that have come in in the last few years, things like ride-sharing, micro-mobility, how those link with public transit. But it seems like the conversation kind of got upended uh, with the pandemic, that that really changed the conversation, at least the immediate one that we need to have. How has the emergence of the pandemic really changed the nature of the conversation around the future of transportation? Well, I think, unfortunately, COVID-19 has really moved people back into their cars. During our four and a half years at DOT, we were really emphasizing livable and sustainable communities, walking and biking paths, bike share, uh, the, really investing in transit, whether it be uh, battery-powered buses, whether it be uh, helping transit systems all over the country enhance, whether it be uh, enabling places like Denver with their Fast Tracks program, uh, the trains uh, from six different locations into the Denver area. Uh, and frankly, that pretty much has come to a stop. I think people, uh, when they're not staying home, uh, when they're going to the grocery store or the, or the drug store or the church or wherever, uh, they're back in their automobiles. Now, there are many Americans who rely exclusively on, um, on transit, on buses, on trains, particularly those that live in the urban areas. So uh, they're, they're, they're trying to, to work their way back into those modes of transportation, but it's not easy. Yeah, that was actually wouldn't be where I was going to take it next. I mean, there's two really big impacts uh, that you've alluded to. The first is people are getting in their cars more. It's, you know, clearly, you know, if you want to socially distance, physically distance, and you have access to a car, being in a car is a lot more physically distant than sharing a ride on an Uber or Lyft or uh, getting on a, a bus or even, um, you know, some of the other micro mobility options. Um, and the other impact that you talked about, which is profound in your world in the sort of transportation planning is the dramatic declines we've seen in ridership. So there's obviously a significant and important segment of the population that relies 100% on public transit, but the revenues for everyone who isn't in that category are choosing other methods. How big of an impact is it having on the sustainable funding base for public transit agencies across the country? Well, traditionally, uh, transit systems around the country have relied for about 40% of their revenue from the federal government. And that's, uh, that's been sustained for a long, long period of time. And uh, I believe that as we continue to fight the COVID-19 and enable transit systems around the country, the federal government's gonna have to make some investments. I don't really believe people are going to get back to transit, back to trains, back to buses, back to that kind of mobility until there's a vaccine, because they simply do not want to be in crowds. They, Even though people are required to wear masks, they're not sure if these uh, modes of transportation are sanitized the way they would like and so forth. And so I think that just as the federal government stepped up for the airlines, 
and are considering stepping up for motor coach vehicles, there will have to be a huge influx of federal resources in order to sustain transit systems until they can get back to some sort of normalcy uh, in terms of ridership. Now, that would seem like a just common sense, nonpartisan idea, but obviously everything these days is partisan, and you're particularly uh, skilled and adept at navigating this. You're a lifelong Republican who also served as a cabinet member in the Obama administration. Do you think this should be a partisan issue, and do you think this will be a partisan issue? Well, I agree with you. Everything is partisan uh, today, and the leading up to the election, I think everything will be partisan but for the major cities, the major metropolitan areas, and, and even in my hometown of Peoria, where I'm at today, you know, we have a transit system. Uh, they, they, they're gonna need cash because people are not riding the buses in Peoria, but particularly places like Chicago, uh, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Detroit, where they have huge transit and people really rely on it uh, to get to their workplace, and in many instances, to get to the grocery store or doctor's appointment, uh, these transit systems are hurting very, very badly for the fact that they're lacking in fare box resources. They're going to need the help of the federal government. I believe this will be an issue that can be taken care of in the next e economic stimulus and will be brought forward uh, by members of Congress from all over the country places like Peoria, but also the big cities too. And do you think we'll see a push for, from both parties? Obviously, probably not the same levels of support, but do you think we'll see a bipartisan push for funding of public transit? I really do, because I think most members of Congress recognize that, that uh, nurses and healthcare workers and, and, and people that have to go to work every day to take care of the, 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 the patients and the victims of Corona-19 need good transportation and the transit systems need the resources. So uh, I, I believe that the federal government will step up. I think it will be bipartisan. Deciding on the number is always, is always a debatable issue. And you mentioned that probably we are gonna see a decline, sustained decline in ridership of public transit and shared uh, transportation until we have a vaccine. Accepting that as the likely reality, how do we continue to invest and at what level do you think we should continue to invest in these future leaning methods of transportation such as ride sharing and autonomous vehicles versus sort of dealing with the here and now? How do we sort of adjust mm -hmm. to the current reality and build for a sustainable future? I think we need to probably uh, for the moment invest in those modes of transportation that people really rely on, like our buses, like our trains, like our light rail, and make those kind of investments the way that we have in the airlines. There's a, you know, articles out today saying the airlines are gonna lay off thousands of people if they don't get another infusion of dollars. In that bill, and when Congress does help the airlines again, there ought to be help uh, for transit agencies and I think we may have to set aside some of the more non-traditional modes of transportation, like uh, ride share, like uh, uh, bike share, and so forth, in order to give people the assurance that the more traditional forms of transportation will be available, will be sustainable, and will get the kind of funding that they need. And have you seen any push for sort of uh, some of these you know, you mentioned bikes. Obviously, bikes aren't suitable for the whole population. You know, I doubt we're going to have an elderly at risk population suddenly turn to bikes, but they do offer right. a green, safe way of getting around during the pandemic. How do you, in your mind, sort of balance these two issues of the near term and the long term? Well, I do think that there will be a certain age group of uh, healthcare workers and others that need sustainable transit and good transit and dependable transit. But there's also another group of people. Um, many of them are not really working. Many of them are not getting on the bikes and riding to work, but they may be using them for other, for other kinds of transportation. I think it'll be incumbent upon the cities where these 
uh, alternate forms of transportation exist uh, to pick up the slack while the federal government invests in the more traditional transit. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your thoughts, especially as you have so much experience in this area. Uh, Ray LaHood, former Transportation Secretary, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. Up next is our View from the Top segment with Axios VP Kristen Burkhalter and Lyft Chief Policy Officer Anthony Fox. Thank you, Ina. It's now my pleasure to introduce Anthony Fox, the current Chief Policy Officer at Lyft, former Transportation Secretary under President Obama, and former Mayor of Charlotte. Thank you for joining us today, Anthony. Thank you, Kristen. Good to be with you. So last week, you had the chance to speak to Axios CEO last Friday, Jim Vandehei, and you discussed the policy disputes in California and how it impacts the current workforce. This week, I'd like to dive into something a little different with you. Brands are adjusting given the current political and social environment. How has Lyft responded to this moment? Well, we are, we're in every uh, large community across the country. Um, the, the community is affected by a lot of the racial and social unrest in this country. Our communities uh, of our drivers, communities of our riders, um, and, and cities and communities that we care about. And so uh, we, we, we feel very much connected to a lot of the issues and questions and uh, tumult that is out in the country today. Uh, as a result, we have, um, we've taken several steps. Uh, we had many pre-existing relationships with national organizations and civil rights organizations. But in recent months, we've actually stepped that up pretty substantially uh, we have uh, provided $500,000 in ride credits, for example, to national civil rights organizations such as the National Urban League, the NAACP, the Black Women's Roundtable, National Action Network, and several others. Uh, and we've, we've deployed those ride credits in places where people uh, need them. We, we've also uh, done uh, and supported um, a number of, uh, of solidarity rides through our back bike share program where uh, people from all backgrounds are coming together to express their support for Black Lives Matter. And uh, we continue to work uh, to, uh, to, to, to push our Lift Up Alliance, uh, something that we announced recently where we're providing 1.5 million rides uh, to help uh, many under-resourced Black communities create better access to transportation. And that's, that's just a few things we're doing. Uh, you know, this, again, a lot of the work we've been doing preexisted the current uh, set of crises, but we are also taking it up another couple of notches in light of what's happening across the country. Really fascinating and appreciate everything that you guys are doing. Let's go a little deeper on that. Why is racial equity so important to you and Lyft? Well, as a as a company, we believe that we have a role to play in 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 helping to correct past injustices. And one of the more underrepresented or under discussed uh, injustices is is lack of access to transportation. Uh, what can you do uh, to get to a better school without better transportation or better health care or uh, better food? You know, through uh, grocery stores and, and so forth. And so. There are a whole host of things that transportation either opens up or keeps closed away from certain communities. And we, we believe uh, a big part of our business is, is to try to help increase connectivity to people to the opportunities they need. Uh, and as I said before, um, you know, the communities affected by, uh, by police brutality uh, are, are communities of our drivers, are communities of, uh, of our riders. And so uh, when they are hurting, when they are feeling unsafe, when they are feeling uh, uh, aggrieved, we, we feel the same. We feel the same way. So that's that's why we we've stepped up in a big way. Right, and you touched on this. Low income neighborhoods have historically had limited access to transportation. So yeah. how is expanding mobility choices to better serve these underserved communities? Yeah, this is one of the one of the really under under reported parts of uh, of rideshare, which is that that forty percent of Lyft rides start or end 
in low-income communities. I want to say that one more time. 40% of, of our rides start or end in low-income low communities. Um, that means that we're filling a gap that existed, that, that even transit systems haven't been able to fill uh, adequately, that uh, obviously that old taxi systems haven't been able to fill. And we take that, uh, that very seriously. That, that's part of, of what we've done to democratize transportation, and it's one of the really critical things. And, and speaking from a prior life, both as mayor and as transportation secretary, where I spent a lot of my time working to break down uh, some of these barriers to transportation, uh, we can't have enough companies in the private sector who are focused on this. So we take this uh, as, as part of our mission. And we also recognize that we have a responsibility to the communities uh, that, are, that are being served by us to, to, be, a, uh, to be a contributor to, uh, to, to racial reconciliation in this country and to helping people uh, realize the promise of opportunity. Right. And so, you know, on a daily and a monthly basis, how does Lyft view its role in these local economies? We we feel like we're part of the ecosystem. We we've never we've never wanted to 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 overtake public transit because we believe public transit is an essential uh, service that uh, that 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 only the public can do. But we do believe that we serve a role in connecting uh, so many communities. And again, you know, with forty percent of our rides starting and ending in low income neighborhoods, that tells the story right away. But then you add to that, like in places like Chicago, where 60% of our rides start or end at a transit stop, it's another important uh, factor. The other piece is that, um, aside from our core business, we also, as, as we've talked about, have many partnerships within communities that are providing services to people. People who, for example, live in, um, live in parts of Washington, D.C. that are underserved by by uh, healthy food and, 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 and good grocery stores. We, we are helping organizations in areas like Anacostia move uh, residents uh, to better grocery stores and get them uh, fresh food. You know, it sounds simple, sounds basic, but when you don't have those basic uh, things at your beck and call or, or, or within easy reach, it's a very difficult thing to overcome. So we are helping communities every single day through the core business, but we're also taking our superpower, uh, which is transportation, and we are uh, making that available to people who really need it. Right. And it's been an interesting two weeks with the Democratic convention, with the Republican convention. Lyft seems to be stepping up. But what do policymakers need to do right now to step up and work with companies like Lyft? considering yeah. the challenges that our country is facing? Well, I, I'd say a couple of things. I, I, I think on this, on the, on the racial, uh, racial strife that, that, is, that is roiling the company, uh, c- country right now, um, we've got to recognize this isn't partisan. It, you, know, it, it, you know, somebody getting shot in the back is not partisan. Someone who's got uh, an officer's neck on, uh, uh, knee on the neck, that's not partisan. Um, and I, I really hope that our leaders um, across the board can recognize that the history of brutality uh, is a long one in this country uh, and that law enforcement, uh, you know, like it or not, has been part of the history uh, of, of, uh, of selective enforcement and, and, and selective brutality towards African-Americans. So it's a legacy we have to understand and we have to try to fix it. And on a bipartisan basis, Hopefully we can get to that point. Um, beyond that, you know, just fixing the criminal justice system seems like a huge mountain to climb, but there's so many other things we need to tackle. And, you know, the connection that people need to transportation and, and getting to the schools and to the hospitals and to the grocery stores and to the jobs that they need to have to realize their dreams, um, we've got to have a strong ecosystem there. So for policymakers, I would just say, uh, companies like ours are not uh, in any way the enemy of progress. We are trying to work as hard as we can to create those those access points, and uh, we're doing the best we can to create partnerships with government that enable us to do uh, better by communities and also uh, 
to ensure that that our drivers and people who use our platform are well taken care of. Great, fantastic points and lots of calls to action. Anthony, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you and we appreciate Lyft for sponsoring these two worthy conversations and have a great weekend. Back to you, Ina. Thank you, Kristen. Thanks, Kristen. Our next guest is the commissioner of the Chicago Department of Transportation, Gia Biaggi, uh, joining us from Chicago. Thanks, Gia. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So, I mean, we've been talking a lot in this session and in the previous ones of sort of how do we balance this goal of long-term sustainability and equity in transportation while taking into account the very real uh, near-term impacts that COVID is having on the way that people are and aren't getting around. How are you looking at that in Chicago? Yeah, it's a great question. And, it's, you know, prior to COVID, it was something we were already thinking about in terms of what does mobility justice look like? What does equity look like? How do we connect the dots between where people are in our city and where they need to be as easily as possible? And as we were working on that, of course, COVID made everything harder, everything more difficult. Um, and so one of the things that we've been doing is looking at what we can do to, one, uh, help folks to be more comfortable to continue to use our public transit system. And that's one that compared to other large cities, we never stopped running our trains and our buses. Um, but how we can do that in a way that enables that social distancing, recognizing that most of our communities um, that need to use the public transit system, particularly black and brown communities, are also parts of the city that haven't had the investment that needs to happen, um, that hasn't happened over the last uh, decades, several decades. And so what we're trying to do is connect the dots with both micromobility things that we can do, investments in the actual infrastructure, uh, but keeping top of mind that where we see uh, comorbidities for COVID also overlaps where we've seen the effects of structural racism and disinvestment that are fundamental, fundamentally policy choices that have been made in our city for many years. Definitely. And as you mentioned, one of the things that you and other cities were trying to do is address the inequities that already existed in terms of which neighborhoods were connected, which neighborhoods were connected with which modes of transit. Oftentimes, I know in San Francisco and other places, you know, the poorer sections are more likely to be connected with buses and the, you know, the faster forms tend to go to the wealthier areas. I'm curious how you sort of deal with the added layer of ridership going down and funding as a result often going down. I know that's obviously a big issue across the country. Is it something you think that Chicago and other cities can solve on their own? Do they need federal help? Yeah, I think we need all hands on deck uh, to really get this right. I think, as you point out, a lot of the funding models are based on ridership, not coverage, right? And the difference is riderships is where you have high densities and often in your economic centers and your core kind of uh, areas. And then in your the balance of your city, though, where you have a lot of geography where we do, you may not have the numbers, but you have the need. Uh, and so what we've been trying, so yes, we need help at the federal level, we need help at the state level, and also locally. Uh, and so what we've been doing are things like very intentional extensions of parts of our transit system um, right now in COVID. So whether that's we're getting ready to deploy some pop-up um, bus priority zones, some lanes, uh, to really expand that network so we can get more buses moving more often to connecting neighborhoods. Um, but also, our, I mentioned our micromobility network, um, Divi, through our a very good our partner Lyft, we've expanded uh, from essentially uh, 71st Street on Chicago, if you know Chicago, all the way to the city limits, which is a huge portion of the south side. It's an additional 50 miles of coverage we've added to our network on top of the 100 miles we had. And that was a, that's a very intentional way that we are connecting these kinds of other modes um, to the whole transit network as a whole. Um, and I, you know, I can talk also about other um, things that we're doing, like with our scooter uh, rollout, which you know, folks laugh at scooters. It sounds like it's a toy, but actually it's really a fundamental piece of the mobility network that can get us to places where we don't have that transit station yet. Um, and that's been a, a, an enormous rollout that we've done on a pilot basis this fall um, that covers the entire city, uh, except for the Central Business District. Um, I was going to say, except for downtown and yeah. the lake, right? Yeah. And yeah, why and Why were those choices made? Yeah. So, and this is the, a lot of these decisions were made pre-COVID. Um, we did a scooter pilot last year and really looked at 
what equity uh, could mean, uh, how it was or wasn't living up to it, what some of the needs were, some of the challenges with being in the public way and clutter and those kinds of things. And so we actually, you know, I, I say we, we want to measure twice and cut once if we finally get to um, doing scooters full bore. So this second pilot is looking at how we can really apply uh, metrics around equity that prioritizes communities that are outside the areas that typically would be served by these uh, transit services. Now, the loop, um, it's its definitely a much more congested place. It's one that we're hopefully going to graduate into. Um, but really, our goal is it's neighborhood focused. Can we make a better network? And so we're trying to do that. And one of the big issues potentially with COVID, in addition to we've talked about sort of the lower uh, economics coming in, the the less fair revenue and that for it. The other issue potentially is if people feel safer in their cars as they do return to the offices, is there more car traffic? And as you know, it doesn't take that much of an increase in car traffic to add up to a real increase in congestion. How are you thinking about that? What questions should we and other cities be asking about this? Yeah, there's we have a real fear of Carmageddon, right? Uh, and, you know, Migrating back to cars, going back to the way things were, is not the future, right? The future is figuring out how we can get more folks moving around our city as easily as possible and not in cars. So in addition to doing things like bus uh, rapid transit, pilot lanes, we've also tried to reposition what the street means to people. That is, that a street is not just about cars. It's about moving and it's about place. And so by launching initiatives like our Shared Streets program, which limits cars, prioritizes people and bikes, slows things down, uh, we're actually helping Chicagoans to see that their street should be doing other things and that if we can complement that with enough modes of alternative transit as opposed to a car, then we can really reposition the quality of life for many neighborhoods by connecting people to seeing their streets and repurposed for pedestrians, for cyclists, and that extends to hopefully the whole network. So that like COVID gave us the chance to experiment with that dialogue with communities. Uh, and in Chicago's case, um, you know, we actually asked communities, do you want this? What are you interested in? Let's do this experiment together. And we found that we now have a clamor for folks to say, you know what, my street should not be prioritized for cars. I actually love the idea that my kids and I can go walk down the middle of the street. Um, and so we're setting up, I think, breadcrumbs for a different kind of future. And how long do you think it will take to get to uh, even back to where we were in terms of public transit usage? Do you think we're going to have a, a slowdown in the use of public transit because of COVID even once more things reopen? Or do you think we pick up where we were before the pandemic? Yeah, I, I think, you know, a couple of things. What we're seeing in Chicago is that the folks who've always depended on public transit are still taking public transit. They have to. And so I think there is certainly a segment of how we use it uh, that will come back. And particularly, you know, if we can get to the point where there's a vaccine, we can have uh, more folks on more of these systems. Uh, but we need to do the work to move them faster. Um, we need to do the work to think about what on-demand uh, public transit kind of looks like. Um, that's all the kind of thinking that we're trying to bring to bear. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the city thinking about mobility, thinking about how we connect all of these systems, whether it's through the technologies that tell you what demand looks like and where you can go, um, to really operationalizing. And that's that's where we've got to get to right now. Um, but I think the landscape, I expect it to look different. Um, and in fact, something that cities need to do, I think, is look holistically at where are we deploying our economic centers, right? How do we distribute wealth throughout our city that can have a fundamental change in how people move around that city. Um, and so, you know, our, we have our hopes, <laughs> but we also have some realities um, that public transit, it's, it's as fundamental as any other part of what makes your economy run and what makes people have a great quality of life. And real quickly in the half minute or so that we have left, uh, how big is the financial crisis facing public transit, not just in Chicago, but across the country, given the impact of the pandemic? I, it's dire. I mean, especially since so much of the funding model is based on like how many people purchase that fare. Um, and you're looking at numbers in Chicago where we're at, you know, uh, 70 percent or it's 30 percent of what we were in terms of ridership. That is a, it's it's huge. So we need a new funding model. We need to see it as a, a basic right to public transit um, in every city. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Gia Biaggi. Thank you. Thank you for having me.
Our next guest is Clarence Anthony, the CEO and Executive Director of the National League of Cities. Welcome, Clarence. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, it's great to be able to have this opportunity to speak to your viewers. Definitely. And, you know, we've been having this conversation on transportation and the age of COVID. And one of the things that's come up is there were already big challenges when it came to both the equity and sustainability of transportation. And COVID has obviously reshaped transportation generally. How much harder has it made these long-term goals that we've been working towards in terms of equity and sustainability by the real-term, real-world impacts that we've all experienced over the last few months? Yeah, well, for the National League of Cities and mayors and council members all over America, it has really brought to to light uh, the real challenge of equity. And the equity issue here is that um, people of color um, have tended to uh, get the highest percentage of cases of the COVID as well as uh, die from uh, COVID impact, in fact, four times. And when you talk about the reason why is most of it is because they are essential workers. They're the ones that have to get on our public transportation system and other uh, ride share uh, systems to be able to get to work. They're the ones that are uh, at the restaurants and they're the ones that's at the hotels. So this is really um, uh, highlighted that transportation equity is tangible and in in important to, for city leaders to look at as they look at the data and response uh, to this big challenge. We have had and seen a big issue as it relates to the equity and the transportation connection uh, for people of color. And one of the things that we've also seen is there's a difference between the highest levels of ridership routes and the highest levels of need routes. The highest levels of ridership might be Um, you know, in the middle of a congested urban core where there's lots of people, but there are other options, whereas the highest level of need, as you mentioned, might be transporting essential workers. Uh, I know in San Francisco, for example, we've seen a dramatic decrease in the number of bus lines, you know, in part understandable given the decline in ridership. But obviously, as you mentioned, a lot of those essential workers that rely on public transit still need it. How do you balance those things as well as the big drop in revenue that uh, transit systems all across the country have experienced? I think that's a big challenge for city officials. And that's one of the reasons why we are fighting for additional dollars uh, for transit systems in America. As Congress talks about all the other issues, uh, cities and transportation systems are essential to making sure that our nation uh, returns uh, not back to normal, but in a way that uh, our um, economy uh, returns back to normal. You know, when we think about uh, transportation systems, a lot of times we don't think about the jobs that are connected to them. And so those bus routes that have been uh, cut, sometimes they are, in fact, those that are traveling uh, 25, 30 minutes uh, to their jobs. And they have to have those routes in order uh, to perform and provide for uh, their families, just like those that are blessed like uh, myself to be able to have other options. City leaders really are, they they are looking at the data. They are looking at how they can replace those. And we know that that connectivity is important to the lives of those that uh, are not as prosperous as we are. And we've talked about this at the edges a little bit this week and last in terms of the piece of transportation equity really flowing to all other kinds of equity. And talk about how important access to transportation is uh, when it means an access to job, which obviously is what provides money for housing. How critical is transportation in the overall keeping people out of poverty, keeping people employed goal that I think all of society shares? You know, even before COVID, uh, transportation has been one of the most important uh, mechanisms for people uh, of all uh, populations to uh, access uh, uh, jobs. And uh, if you live uh, 25, 30 minutes to an hour because you can't afford to live in the urban markets, uh, it's going to cost you a lot more 
uh, to come in to the urban market for those jobs. And now with COVID, it has become more uh, essential uh, that we have uh, the access uh, to transportation and the access to jobs. If we don't connect those two, which city leaders really are working hard at doing, we're not going to be able to see where uh, the prosperity for all of our citizens in America uh, occurs. So we know that um, all modes is important. We know the public transit system, we know ride share is very important. And if we know that, what we're asking is our federal leaders and our state leaders and our local leaders to work together to get those dollars and get those connections to happen for those who are looking for a real opportunity. And you mentioned ride sharing, and I'm curious how you see some of these other forms of transportation that are on the horizon, both ride sharing, which is obviously here today, and autonomous vehicles, which hold some equity promise in terms of allowing senior citizens, for example, to retain independence even after they can't drive. But at the same time, how concerned are you that some of these new forms of transportation won't be made equally accessible, uh, that we'll see autonomous vehicles come first to wealthier areas versus people that might need them more? I think that that's a good question because I recognize that um, all of those forms of uh, transportation will enter our market. And we know that from practice uh, that there has to be a plan. And most often it comes from the federal and state level. And then it has to go to the streets uh, of and communities of local communities, I think city leaders are very knowledgeable and, and acknowledge that those transportation options must be implemented uh, in an equitable manner. But we also know the market drives where uh, companies will invest, and I think that's the fight that city leaders have all the time. We know where uh, the transportation route should occur. But I do think that most often we will see uh, those uh, options uh, rolled out more so in those communities that are not um, uh, that are wealthy and not poor. What is our role as city leaders? It is to make sure that the equity is brought into the policy and the process, and that we demand that all of those services, like the ride share and the public um, uh, services are brought to all communities in an equal way. Just like broadband, if it's not there, those communities would not prosper. If options for all transportation systems are not in all communities, we will leave those communities behind even further. And it happens to be in the Black, uh, Latina communities in America. We cannot let that happen over and over again. And we only have about a minute left, but I want to touch briefly. We've talked mostly about transit and cars and that sort of thing, micromobility. Um, air travel doesn't get talked a lot about as a equity and economic issue, but how important is it that we're seeing, um, you know, companies like American Airlines, I think this week said they're going to cut service to some of these smaller markets. You know, if I'm in LA or San Francisco or New York, you know, I may kind of shrug my shoulders, but how important is it to these smaller cities to have these air connections and how important is it to their local economies? Yeah, it's very important. And it is uh, disappointing that the airlines are cutting services to those communities, those mid uh, small cities and small regions. And it means so much more to those because it means your ability to go to uh, a medical appointment. It means that you have to find a ride an hour and a half uh, from uh, Greenville, uh, North Carolina to Raleigh, North Carolina, where it's the closest, which is a real example. Uh, it's cut off uh, job opportunities, uh, services to those regions. And, and uh, Greenville is a university community. So what you're going to find that uh, the East Carolina University is going to have to find ways to get access to jobs uh, and businesses. It is a devastation. And a lot of times, again, in the large markets like where you are in San Fran and where I am in Washington, D.C., one or two routes don't make a difference. To the small and mid-sized communities, it means life and death of those regions and those communities. 
transportation well, equity is achievable and it's tangible, and we need to make sure that it is implemented in America. Well, thank you so much. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there, but I appreciate your taking the time. Clarence Anthony, Executive Director and CEO of the National League of Cities. Thank you for having me and uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk about how cities are essential. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank all of you for joining us this afternoon for another virtual conversation. I hope it helped make you smarter, faster. I know I've learned a lot. Um, if you enjoyed this conversation and would like to continue having more Axios in your life, we have a number of daily newsletters, including Login, the tech newsletter that I help write each weekday. You can get that and all of our other newsletters at signup.axios.com. Uh, I'd also like to, again, thank our sponsor, Lyft, for making the conversation possible and all of you for joining. Thank you. <laughs>